Um, you'll recall that this morning during the opening statements I mentioned that this challenge has benefited from having a good relationship and deep engagement with ministers. And Minister Parker's attendance today is a demonstration of that. Um, Minister, we appreciate that you've rearranged your diary today at very short notice to join us at the conference and it speaks to your ongoing support for the work that uh, has been done in this challenge. We have people here from throughout New Zealand and from other countries. People have worked in the challenge in many and diverse ways and who are deeply committed to the aim of a healthy and sustainable ocean system and marine economy. It's my pleasure to extend our welcome to you on behalf of us all and to introduce you uh, in your, your many portfolios. So um, please welcome Minister David Parker, who is our Attorney General, who is Minister for the Environment, Minister of Revenue, Associate Minister of Finance, and as of today, also Acting Minister of Oceans and Fisheries, a portfolio that he held previously from 2020 until February 23. So he's very familiar with, with us in this work. So tēnā koe, welcome to Minita. Uh, th thank you for those, uh, that kind introduction. You're quite right, I didn't expect to be here. It's some sadness that I am, actually. Um, uh, I'm sure if, um, if uh, Stuart Nash was here, he'd probably be making an apology. It's not really for me to make an apology on his behalf, but I know he will regret not being here. Uh, um, and I'm sorry we've mucked you around today, because... Uh, I think the officials rightly thought that uh, it would probably be difficult for me to attend, but um, uh, I um, had a cabinet committee that I was able to get out the latter half of and uh, wanted to come here to, um, uh, to pay my respects to you mainly um, uh, and uh, just to, uh, I suppose, emphasise that the business of government goes on somewhat seamlessly sometimes, even though the uh, the faces in front of you change in unexpected ways at times. So um, I, I, I have got some notes that have been prepared for uh, uh, Stuart Nash, um, and I will run through some of them. But I, I suppose one of the reasons why I wanted to come down here was that uh, I know the work that uh, Julie Hall leads uh, that's been done across the country. and. Uh, sometimes with international collaboration is so important to us uh, as a nation. Uh, it's good to see the representatives of science, uh, including iwi scientists, uh, iwi, some of whom aren't scientists, but um, who uh, uh, so believe in the importance of sustainable uh, oceans. Uh, and. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing the insights that come out of the program next year as to what we, you know, as you gather together the, uh, the results of all of your considerations that you've had over the years in the science challenge. Uh, and I, I can tell you that as a, uh, a, a Minister for the Environment and over time, times Minister of Oceans and Fisheries, I've... Um, I've learned the importance of what it is that you're up to to try and uh, uh, achieve, uh, achieve better outcomes. Um, I, I know that you know, we've got one of the biggest exclusive economic zones in the world. Our seaward area that we have responsibility for 15 times larger than our land-based areas. Uh, and uh, uh, not only, and, you know, obviously an, an important driver of economic outcomes for the industries that are reliant on that, such a huge part of our way of life uh, as New Zealanders, because so many live us, of us live essentially right next to the to the sea, um, uh, and therefore the oceans have become such a important part of our culture. Uh, particularly so for Tangata Whenua, but uh, I think for every. Virtually every New Zealander feels uh, similarly. And of course, there's lots of uh, competing interests. There's recreational interests, there's conservation interests, there's uh, commercial interests. Uh, increasingly, uh, you can see that there are some challenges to deal with in terms of offshore wind, if we're going to 
decarbonise our, our economy and transport industrial heat. We need a lot more renewable energy, and it's likely that some of that's going to be uh, wind power. Um, and we've got to work through all of these issues uh, at the same time as we do a bit better in protecting these vulnerable species that we are custodians of. Uh, and um, yeah, we've got the challenges of climate, changing sea temperatures, and what that's going to do to the distribution of of uh, species. Uh, we've got the challenges of pests, uh, whether it's pest seaweed species uh, or, or other challenges. We've got uh, these unmet challenges worldwide as we move to try and protect uh, representative uh, biodiversity around the world. We've got 30 per cent protection targets. Uh, we know that in that area we actually do pretty well uh, in New Zealand uh, on land. Uh, we've got some very, very significant areas uh, preserved in the conservation estate. Um, uh, we've got our challenges on land, of course, with some of the mammalian predators that uh, target our bird species that weren't, uh, that didn't uh, evolve in a way that gives them natural protection against some of those pest species. But at sea, we've got a long, long further way to go. Um, as a government, uh, we acknowledge uh, that we need to do better on that. We've got a few things at large that we're trying to uh, progress, whether it's the Hauraki Gulf uh, protections, where we've got this area which is so rich in biodiversity but so pressured by our largest population uh, centre being right next to it. Uh, we've got uh, Rangitahua, the Kermadex uh, uh, issues that we've been trying to progress uh, with uh, with Maori uh, interests, uh, and we've got a, a recognition in government that the current marine protection tools are too blunt uh, and uh, effectively prevent us making progress for some of the protection that we need uh, outside of those areas that I've uh, I've uh, spoken about. Internationally, you know, it is good that we've uh, we've uh, uh, landed new global targets for global biodiversity framework. Um, uh, and you know we obviously need to to play our part in those issues. I, I've often have thought to myself that um, we have met, and some of you may have heard me say this, and you think, oh, this is boring, but it is a truth that drives some of my work. That we have so many advantages in New Zealand. We have. Um, uh, we've got this huge richness in uh, natural resources, fisheries, forestry, soil, water, um, biodiversity. Really, really one of the richest countries in the world in that sense. We're sometimes called the Saudi Arabia of renewable resources. Uh, so if we can't sort of decarbonise our energy system, sort of no one else can. Um, we have the rule of law which is very, very important to environmental outcomes. Without it, you just cannot have the regulatory settings that you need to stop uh, people going too far when it comes to despoiling environmental outcomes. We've got a wonderful environmental ethic. And I think we're really, really lucky that we have this fusion of uh, 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 Maori values uh, uh, and a very communal view of resources but also a sense that those uh, uh, taonga are part of people. I'm the river, the river is me, the river is my ancestor. So we've got that thread of our country coming through very strongly, which I think if I, and maybe this is a bit Pollyanna-ish, but I, 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 I think that the settlers that came to New Zealand saw something in that that they really, really liked compared with the excessive privatisation of those sorts of uh, resources in the United Kingdom, like you know, access to waterways and things. So the settlers that came to New Zealand really embraced a lot of those Maori values in a way that uh, they, they, they found them very nice and endearing. On the other hand, the, uh, ex the greater population pressures that there already were in those countries that were the source of most of the, uh, the um, colonisation migration, they had experienced the tragedy of the commons 
where there wasn't protection of those common resources, uh, and they also had experience of the investment advantages of privatisation of some resources, which give people an interest in resources. And you know, fishing quote is an example of this: that if you have a property interest in something, then you can support the investments that are needed in the fishing vessels and the um, people that you need to develop those resources. So we've got those fusion of those two cultures. And then we have uh, wealth uh, uh, and, um, and high incomes that you need to, to, uh, to um, do the, the good things that you need to pay for. And so I reflect that if with all of those advantages, New Zealand can't improve our outcomes, well, then no one can. Uh, and on the one hand, you think that's a bit depressing, but you flip that on its head and you actually think we do have all those wonderful advantages. We can do better, and actually I think we are, as a country, doing better in a lot of domains, uh, and underpinning what it is that you do need to do uh, is knowledge, and therefore this brings me back to the, the science challenge uh, and why I see it as so important. Um, in respect of the, um, how we're trying to manage these issues as a government a bit more holistically, we've put oceans and fisheries together. Uh, um, we, in my role now, I have someone servicing my, the, the bridge between my office and the different government departments. It's not just fisheries people now, it also includes conservation people. Uh, obviously, we've made a bit of progress in modernising some of the fisheries rules, and uh, we, you know we're, we're requiring all fish to be landed, with some limited exceptions. We've got cameras on boats, uh, and um, we'll you know expect to see better outcomes on on that. Um, in respect of the um, the fisheries industry, and because we want good economic outcomes as well. We're developing an industry transformation plan, which will, uh, we hope, lead to uh, to better outcomes. We're trying to improve aquaculture outcomes. Um, I'm also responsible for the resource management reform. It's been so so hard for the aquaculture industry in New Zealand to do anything uh, because the processes have been so sclerotic that people have spent millions and millions of dollars to no good outcome. Uh, and uh, we've got to be able to do a, a bit better, uh, a bit better on that front as well. So um, uh, we've also had inputs from the chief science advisor, who did a report uh, for uh, the then prime minister Jacinda Ardern, uh, and uh, pointed out that there are many things that can, we can already do to improve outcomes without a change in legislation uh, under the under the Fisheries Act, and we're trying to. Uh, uh, incorporate those decisions uh, more holistically. Um, I, I'm really looking forward to some of the ideas that come forward in respect of estuarine protection. Some of you will be aware that I have a particular interest in estuaries. They are the thing that sit at the bottom of our catchments, and if those estuaries are degrading, then you've got problems upstream that really aren't properly under control. Uh, I, I, uh, I have met with members of the science, uh, the, 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 um, this science challenge in respect of getting input as to what indicators we use to assess whether we're going better or worse in, in those estuaries. I, uh, I think we need biological indicators mainly in estuaries. Um, some of them I think we can, we can sometimes get too complex in these things. and. Uh, if, we're, if it's complex, it sometimes never gets uh, implemented. Uh, I, I would like to see in some of our estuaries a simple indicator. If it used to be rich in flounder, uh, maybe you should be trying to improve things until the, at such time as the flounder come back, because of course flounder need crabs and, uh, to eat, and crabs need shellfish as part of their ecosystem. And, if you've got too much sediment in the estuary, you won't have cockles and you won't have crabs and you won't have flounder. So um, I know it's a bit more complex than that. But um, yeah, so this is a bit rambling because I really wasn't expecting to be here today. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm happy to, uh, to, uh, to uh, answer uh, some questions. Uh, but I'm mainly here to, to honour your work. Thank you.
Minister, thank you for coming at such short notice. I told everyone here that you and I are great friends and we'd played rugby together. Um, but look, we, uh, we did, honestly. We were both buddy in all blacks, but due to both of us having knee injuries, we no longer made that. Um, the, we've got Slido up, and it's so we can sort of vet questions coming up. We've yeah. only had one question come through, and the question is, do you think that an oceans policy would be a good idea? Um, well, it's such a general question. Obviously, you need oceans policy, um, and having oceans policy is a good idea. But that's such a general question. I, I'm, I'm not. What lies under it? What What do you mean by your oceans policy? You know, preservation targets, um, biodiversity targets. I, I, I'm not sure what's meant by the question. Okay, anonymous. <laughs> <laughs> Would someone like to uh, be a little bit more specific on a question that they've posed there, just so the 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 minister is able to provide a more comprehensive response rather than a generic response to an ocean policy. Okay, I'm going to fess up and say I'll ask that question. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I'm going to try and provide some context for that. I guess yeah. some of the work that we've been doing, the challenge is the fragmented nature of a lot of the legislation and overlapping legislation mm. that governs decision making in the coastal marine environment and places like that. Mm. So what I was thinking when I asked that question, would an oceans policy that stitched together that legislation under one document so they would talk to each other a little better help improve outcomes um, for the marine environment? And I realise mm. it's a big undertaking um, mm. and not one that you will fit in between now and August. But yeah. um, some way of improving that interconnectivity between the various pieces of legislation that govern the, the So like some Marine Protection, Fisheries Act, Resource Management Act, yeah, EZ legislation. Um, probably, but to be honest, I'm so sick of big uh, 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 consolidation uh, projects in the form of the RMA at the moment that I'm not putting my hand up for that one right now. <laughs> Um, I look, I, I think I th I, we, we considered when we were doing RM reform as to whether we should go out to the edge of the EEZ, and we decided it was already too big a project, and indeed we dropped parts out of the project. We haven't uh, done some of the work that's needed in monitoring and enforcement in the resource management system yet, because it was already such a huge project. It has to have limits, otherwise you, can't, you just can't land it. Um, but there is, a, there is a, a need for someone else other than me <laughs> to actually do that very big piece of work that's necessary at sea, and you're quite right, it is necessary. Uh, it was just about landed uh, by Pete Hodgson way back when. Um, it would have been in about the period 2002 to 2005, I think, and it was sort of knocked asunder by some of the mistakes that we made as a government on foreshore and seabed and it just got tied up in that Malay and no government's ever got back to it. Interestingly enough, the person who was in Pete Hodgson's office, who as, a, as, the, as a, an advisor to him, was a guy called John Blinko, who many, many moons ago was a councillor here, like many, many decades ago, and then was an MP. He's still in my office, so he'd probably, uh, he'd probably say, yes, we should be doing it tomorrow. So I would just, on behalf of everybody here, like to say thank you very much. We know that you had to re um, jig well, your well, schedule. I said much, so I don't know what you're thinking. Yeah. Thank you for, to, to, be, to be here, and I just want to reassure you that your message on uh, lessons learned and recommendations that come out of the challenge yeah. is being taken very seriously, and that is one of the key themes that we're addressing over the, the next three days. So thank you very much for your okay, time. Okay, thanks. And if you'd like to join us for lunch, if you have time, you're welcome no, to I've, downstairs. I've, I've got a few questions in the house, so I've got to get back. <laughs> <laughs> thank you.
There was actually a true story about me um, <clears throat> having a shot at being in an All Black. I talked to my coach at the time and he said to me that I'd, uh, he said, Pa, he said, you've probably got the best left foot step in the game. And he said, you've probably got the best right foot step in the game. I said, well, so well, what's the problem? And he said, you just got to stop doing it on defence, bro. <laughs> when a Māori person tells a joke, it's manner enhancing to laugh very loud. <laughs> we don't want those little soft Caucasian laughs. We want those, those big bellowing Billy T. James laughs. Hey, look, that brings um, our, our, our uh, session uh, to a close and, and our morning to a close. Uh, we're heading off uh, back downstairs where we had morning tea uh, for, uh, uh, for lunch. Don't forget there are the research uh, and challenge posters downstairs. Um, do encourage you all to read those. Don't forget we've got the post-it notes down there. Post your ideas up there and help inform the approach moving forward. We will be starting back here. What time are we starting back? Just so I'm sure, now that we've sort of clawed back time that we, or, or given back time, are we still on for 1.45? Um, Julie, we're, I'll make, yes, 1.45. And can I just say this morning, thank you for your punctuality. Thank you for coming up here and being on time. There's nothing greater as uh, an MC to have people who follow the time schedule set out at the program. So I really appreciate that. I'll give you a call at about 1.40 to let you know we've got about five minutes to go, and we'll see you all back here then. All right, take care. Kia ora. I'm the guy double fist and chillin' at the kickback Drinking on a beer with a little side of Jack Heard you cookin' ribs, you better pass me a rack I bought the drinks, Miles got the food Heat's on the way, bout to turn up the mood You said all the shorties came, there's only a few But that's cool, you won't catch me bitchin' Music up loud, knees twistin' Someone's pourin' shots in the kitchen But I better slow down Last scene, a little blacked out Passed out on the ground at the kickback Chillin' out, maxin', relaxin', summertime with a fantastic kickback. I'ma I'm crack another cold one, barbecue chicken almost done, kickback. Ayy, all the shorties came through, and my friends came too, we survive at the kickback. Yeah, and we live from the kickback. What's uh -huh. up? Miles hit me up, said the party was dope. Said to come through, but to bring friends though. I got a car full of bitches, and we on the road. Now we pause for the switches at the Texaco, and we... Rolling the drove, sipping the ghost still. Texting every single chick on my phone to chill. Wasn't bumping till we showed up in. Brought the rum and now everybody humping. Hold up, Scotty, where you at?